Okay, so as I said last time, um, a Wizard of Earthsea may not appear on the face of it to have much to do with the other texts um, that we're reading in this course. It probably feels more like straight up, fant straight up traditional fantasy than most of the others. Um, but I do think that Legin is weaving in elements, particularly from that new wave of British science fiction um, that was influenced very much by the Weird Tales writers of the 30s. Um, and that she is trying very hard to defamiliarize um, certain concepts in 20th century fantasy writing, um, much like Moorcock was trying to do with uh, the Elric stories. So let's dig a little bit deeper into what's going on in this text. It's aimed at a younger audience than most of what we've been reading uh, for this course. And this is a book that was originally sort of aimed at teenagers. Um, but let's talk a little bit about its publication history. Um, Legin was better known at the time she wrote this um, as a writer of science fiction. Um, so this is her first attempt at writing a fantasy novel, um, as well as her first book for younger readers. Right? She had been writing adult science fiction uh, for some time. Probably her, outside of the Earthsea novels, I would say probably her best known book uh, is called The Left Hand of Darkness. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that um, when we look at some of her typical concerns. Um, so this is published by a small California-based press called Parnassus in 1968. And the original edition was published with woodcut style illustrations done by Ruth Robbins, who was the publisher's wife. And that's actually one of my great regrets about this edition that I had you uh, purchase is that it does not include these woodcut illustrations, right? They are um, just sort of small squares um, at the, by the heading for every chapter. Um, they look like, if they're done in this style, they look like medieval woodcuts, but um, they are, you know, they're drawings. And as I said, this was influenced heavily by the new wave of British science fiction, particularly in the way that it sort of tries to work in anthropology um, into, fa in, into fantasy in a way that's not really usual or normal. So as for Legin herself, this is her. She's still alive, born in 1929. Uh, she's the daughter of a UC Berkeley anthropologist, uh, which is where her interest in sort of creating fictional societies uh, seems to come from. Um, she pursued but did not finish a PhD in French literature. And she's known particularly for the intricate and internally consistent construction of her various secondary worlds in her fantasy and in her science fiction. Um, for example, um, in The Left Hand of Darkness, um, a representative from a group of human world, uh, human ruled worlds called the Ecumen um, comes to a planet that is in an ice age. It's, it's in an ice age. Um, and the people on this planet have no fixed uh, gender roles, no fixed biological sex. Right? Essentially, um, biological sex is determined when you, like once a month when you enter a phase called Kemmer, and it's sort of determined by the body chemistry of the, you know, the person around you who also happens to be Kemmering. Um, so <clears throat> the idea is, what, what she wanted to explore is like one, what would life be like for people experiencing a, a prolonged ice age, right? In what ways might the human body adapt to accommodate that? And, How would a society in which there are no fixed gender roles deal with things like resolving disputes? Uh, for, you know, for example, um, on this particular planet, 
there has never been a war, even though there are different nations. So she does have a connection to the pulp magazines. Um, she began uh, her career by publishing in science fiction magazines like Fantastic Stories of Imagination and Amazing Stories. And the world of Earthsea actually first appears in a pulp magazine called Fantastic in 1964, in a story called the, the Word of Unbinding. Essentially, a good wizard is captured by an evil wizard. Um, and has to um, essentially destroy himself to go after this evil wizard in the world of the dead. So let's talk a little bit about the secondary worlds of Earthsea itself. This is a map of the Earthsea archipelago. So we're dealing with a world that is mostly water, that is made up of a series of islands, and all the cultures on it are somehow dependent on water and on sea travel. Most of the islands have their own system of more or less feudal government. Wizards who are trained on the island of Roke form something like a priesthood. Right? They seem to be just about the only group that have a, to have an authority that is respected across most of the islands, with the exceptions possibly of the island of Oskill in the north and the Kargad lands um, in the east, which are uh, suspicious of wizards. There are three major ethnic groups in Earthsea. Right? Most people, the dominant ethnic group are the Hardic peoples, who are dark-skinned and who live in the center and in the various reaches, right? north reach, south reach, reach, east reach, that sort of thing. Ged, for example, belongs to this particular ethnic group. The second ethnic group are the Kargish, who live in the Kargad lands to the northeast here. Um, and the, Kar the Kargs are light-skinned, but um, one of the things that Legin is trying to do here is reverse certain uh, stereotypical racial attitudes. Um, the white people in Earthsea um, are the superstitious barbarians um, who will often go raiding in the Hardic lands. And the Oskillians in the north are the mysterious servants of a magic stone. Um, and in fact, um, the, young, the young woman who first tempts Ged into um, his, the act that will lead to his first major transgression, the summoning of the shadow, ends up as the, uh, the lady, the Countess of Oskill. Now, magic in Earthsea works primarily um, through the memorization and repetition of lists of names of objects, people, and places um, in what they call, what, what the characters call the old speech, right? So there is an ancient language that no one but the dragon speaks anymore, but this becomes the magic of, the, the, the language of magic, right? Everything has a true name in the old speech, and if you know the true name of a thing, then you can summon it, you can control it, or you can change it. So, um, when Ged is first taking his lessons uh, with the Master Hand, the Master Illusionist, on the Isle of Roke, this is what the, the Master tells him about naming magic, right? To change this rock into a jewel, you must learn its true name. And to do that, my son, even to so small a scrap of the world, is to change the world. It can be done. Indeed, it can be done. It is the art of the master changer, and you will learn it when you are ready to learn it. But you must not change one thing, one pebble, one grain of sand, until you know what good and evil will follow on that act. Right? This mirrors lessons that Ged learns from his original master, Ogion, 
who trains him before he goes to Roke, and who in fact gives Ged his own true name. Um, <clears throat> essentially, what the wizard has to keep in mind when he speaks a word of changing or of summoning or of control is how that is going to affect the entire ecosystem that the thing he wishes to change, summon, or control exists in. So, if he wants, for example, this is one of the examples that Ogion uses, if you want to summon rain, right, you can't simply create the rain. You have to summon it from somewhere. And if it's raining on your little patch of ground, that means it's not raining somewhere else. Right, so it seems that there are sort of fixed quantities of matter, fixed quantities um, of really just about anything in Ligin's world. And changing by magic one small thing changes everything else, alters the entire system. And so you have to be very careful, if you're a wizard, about what those alterations are going to do to the entire system. So, I think that this particular idea is closely related to um, a trend in mid-20th century philosophy, um, well, speech act theory. Um, so this is a philosophy of language that is developed by the British philosopher J.L. Austin, and then sort of further developed by H.P. Grice and John Searle. Austin, for example, uh, wrote a book called How to Do Things with Words. So there are two broad types of speech, um, what Austin calls utterances. The first he calls constatives. A constative asserts something about a fact or a state of affairs and can be judged true or false. So, um, if I'm stating a con like, so if I utter a constative, right, um, I am saying something that is true or not true about some state of affairs that already exists, right? So if I say, uh, for example, the government is made up of idiots, um, I am commenting on an existing state of affairs. I am not changing the state of affairs as it is. Now, a performative is an utterance that actually comp accomplishes something, right? It's a sort of a it's an active utterance. It changes the world in some way. So questioning, praising, threatening, right? These all accomplish some action through words. So if I rather than state that I think the government is full of idiots. If I ask someone else, do you think the government is full of idiots? This forces them then to respond to me, right? I have changed the relationship between two people. Um, praise, right? I have affected someone else's attitude. Um, threatening, the same sort of thing. Now, there are also what J.L. Austin calls explicit performatives. So when a performative utterance is made under the right circumstances, or what Austin calls felicitous circumstances, these utterances bring about the state of affairs that they signify. So if I was to walk up to one of you and say, I crown you the King of England, nothing would happen, right? Nothing would change, except that you might think I lost it. I can't make you the King of England. You can't be made King of England in one of these classrooms, right, wearing your street clothes. Even if I, you know, put like a little, you know, like a little paper circle on your head. 
But if I were the Archbishop of Canterbury, if you were in the sort of direct family line of the previous King of England, and if I was holding the crown, right, you come, and we were at, um, you, know, and, you know, we were at Westminster, you would come down that aisle, I would say I crown you king or king or queen of England, put the crown on your head, and that would meet all the circumstances that would actually um, change reality in that way, right? You would then become the king or queen of England. So that's sort of how magic works in Earthsea, right? It works sort of in terms of these explicit performatives. Because of the authority vested in it, because, because a wizard understands the workings of the old speech and the true names, Right? They, can do, they can utter these explicit performatives that actually do change reality. And the wizards of Earthsea do sort of form a kind of priesthood. Right? Their st the structure of wizardry in the Earthsea novels um, is rather similar to uh, centralized religious hierarchy. Right? They're trying to administer from a central seat of authority. Right? Roke is kind of the Vatican of Earthsea. Here we have the School for Wizards on Earth. I'll give you a couple of examples here through, through this lecture of these really actually cool woodcut illustrations that I think added a lot to the text and I'm bummed that they're gone. The wizards are the keepers and transmitters of special knowledge that is kept from the general population and they use amongst themselves a secret language that's assumed to have some sort of power. Right? There's a hierarchical structure. Right? At the very bottom, you have these kind of wandering mendicant wizards who are outside the structure, like what Ged becomes. Uh, you have these village sorcerers, uh, like Vetch, and like Ged is in his uh, first posting. And you also have court mages, and at the top of everything, the archmage and the council of nine masters, right? And the wizards act as intermediaries for lay people between the natural and the supernatural worlds, right? The wizards understand something about the supernatural world that lies beyond the veil. And so they can perform acts of healing, acts of heroism. Um, they can do things for the people of Earthsea. The people of Earthsea can't do them. They can interact with unseen forces on behalf of the peoples of Earthsea. So and this is one thing that Legin ultimately regarded as one of the failings of her Earthsea novels, was that while she really had tried to imagine a very different kind of Earth. There were certain things um, that just sort of crept in from the Earth that she knew and from fant you know, sort of traditional medieval romance as she knew it, right? The, the feudal structures of most of the governments and the sort of priesthood structure of the wizards. Now, <clears throat> At its heart, this novel follows the 19th century literary pattern of the Bildungsroman. You've probably heard of Bildungsromans before. Right? It's a German word that means novel of formation. And a Bildungsroman traces the development of a protagonist's mind, character, and attitudes um, over, um, over the course of adolescence or an apprenticeship. Right, so what you see in a Bildungsroman typically is the development of an adolescent mind, a young person growing into some form of adulthood. And they often involve literal or metaphorical rites of passage or the overcoming of 
a spiritual crisis of some kind. So examples would include um, probably one of the earliest good examples of like kind of the the archetypal Bildungsroman is uh, Johann Wilhelm von Goethe's 1796 novel, uh, The Apprenticeship of Wilhelm Meister, uh, Dickens's Great Expectations, and Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain um, also fit the pattern. Um, James Joyce's uh, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man uh, is, a very, is a rather specialized kind of Bildungsroman that's sometimes called a Kunstlerroman or artist novel um, that traces the development of the mind of an artist. Right? How a boy becomes, or, you know, or a girl becomes an artist. And this is an illustration from Great Expectations of the young boy Pip, who's the narrator, meeting the convict Abel Magwitch, who would become his unseen benefactor in the churchyard as a boy. Okay, so Buildings Roman, a novel of development, concerns rites of passage from one state to another, right? From childhood into adulthood. So let's try and trace Ged's development through this particular novel. Right, so he starts out as a young boy on the Isle of Gaunt, and his power is first discovered there. Right, when he summons the goats to follow him around, and when he deceives the Kargish raiders by summoning that mist. Right, these things lead his aunt, the witch, to start training him, and then he's picked up by the wizard Ogion, who, finished, who further trains him sort of up into adolescence. It's Ogion who gives Ged his true name. Right, we have that actual initiation ceremony, right, in which Ged steps through the waterfall as Dooney, and on the other side of it becomes Ged. His training on Roke, formal education, near the end of which he summons the shadow, the battle with which becomes his life's work, or his early life's work. Right, we have him his, given his first job in the village of Lower Torning, in which he, refail, he fails to restore to life the son of his friend, the fisherman Peshvari, but triumphs over the dragon Yavod At the court of the Terranon, he loses his humanity, he turns into a hawk, and has to be brought back to himself, right, reminded of who he is, that he is a man and not a hawk. And finally, the reintegration of the parts of himself that he had abjected, right, that he'd cast out, that shadow that he summoned on Roke. So, what is this shadow? What is the nature of Ged's shadow? When he first summons it on Roke, it's described thusly. It was like a black beast, the size of a young child, though it seemed to swell and shrink. And it had no head or face, only the four-talent paws with which it gripped Ged. Here we have him facing off against his shadow. Now, when he's recognized the true nature of the shadow, and he meets it again at the end of the novel, this is what happens. Right? Aloud and clearly, breaking that old silence, Ged spoke the shadow's name, and in the same moment, the shadow spoke without lips or tongue, saying the same word, Ged. And the two voices were one voice. Right? He's recognized that the shadow is himself, right? What's happened here is rather similar to what happened in The Fisherman and His Soul, right? The fisherman, not quite considering the consequences of his actions, cuts off, literally, his shadow from himself, right? 
and the soul, separated from the heart, goes out into the world and becomes evil. Now here what Ged has done in a prideful action showing off as a young man, right? he has sort of concentrated all of the evil in himself into this black shadowy beast that he then releases out into the world which then pursues him until he, can, until he knows how to reintegrate it into the self. And so the process that this follows is essentially Jungian. Um, now, Jungian psychology um, is not really regarded all that seriously by psychologists or even by literary critics these days. But in the 1960s, this was, this was a big deal. This was cutting edge stuff. So according to Jung, Carl Gustav Jung, all individuals in a culture have access to a common bank of symbols and archetypes that Jung calls the collective unconscious, right? This is why we all recognize you know, certain concepts. Um, you know, we all have an idea of mother. We all have an idea of hero. We all have certain sort of associations with twins. Um, these come from this kind of reservoir of shared symbols. Um, in fact, the, uh, the fortune-telling cards known as the tarot are painted with archetypes that spark certain kinds of psychological association. There's nothing magical about tarot cards. Usually, um, a good fortune teller is actually a good people reader. And what they're reading is not the cards of your palm, they're reading your responses to what they say. But the tarot still evokes powerful responses from people, in part because these are all recognizable archetypes, right? The fool, the magician, the sun, the star. Now, Jung's teacher, Sigmund Freud, had argued that myth and literature uh, were, by and large, expressions of repressed sexual desires um, that were then sort of coalesced into a more acceptable form of expression. Jung disagreed and argued that myth and literature are instead expressions of this collective unconscious, right? Their collection, their we're sort of pulling from our cultural myth kitty and placing these archetypes into narratives. Now, probably what's more important about Jung for our purposes in examining this story, though, are his, uh, his personality theory, which, um, unlike Freud's, which is three parts, right, the ego, conscious self, um, id, unconscious, um, unconscious survival drives, and superego, um, social pressures. Um, what Jung gives us are four personality elements. The first, the ego is the conscious mind, right? The self that you're aware of. The second, the persona, is the social mask that you wear with other people. Right, the you, the, the face you present to the world. The third, the anima or animus, is your feminine or masculine side. Right? So if you're a man, you have an anima. If you're a woman, you have an animus. And finally, the shadow. These are the abjected portions of your personality. The things that you clamp down, the things you repress, the things from your reptilian lizard, your reptilian brain that you don't want other people to see. You know, your dark primordial drives and desires. It corresponds in some ways to Freud's id. And what Ged has tried to do in this novel is externalize all of these forces, cast them out of himself, but in so doing, he creates a monster that threatens to destroy him. And it's only when he's able to accept 
the shadow portion of his personality and reintegrated into his sense of self, that he is healed. Okay, so that's basically all I have for you on the Wizard of Earthsea. Next time we're going to be looking at Angela Carter's revisions of classic fairy tales um, in The Bloody Chamber and The Company of Wolves. Right? I only want you to read those two stories um, from the collection. You know, read the others if you want. It won't hurt you. But those are the only ones we're going to be focusing on. So the first thing I want you to think about is the, uh, which fairy tales Carter bases these particular stories on. Um, how does she modernize or otherwise revise their original content? And what elements of the weird do we find therein? Secondly, like most fairy tales, particularly those with a female protagonist, the protagonist transgresses against an authority figure in some way. So I want you to think about the nature of the transgression in each of these tales. Third, how does Carter depict romantic and sexual relationships in these stories? And what disturbing latent contents in the fairy tales does she bring to the surface? Right. What things that are buried in the original stories is she pulling out and making obvious? And finally, um, I want you to think about the, I want you to compare relationships between women with relationships between women and men in these stories. Right? What seems to be more important? These sort of lineal female relationships, um, you know, mother, daughter, grandmother, granddaughter, or the husband, wife um, relation, or the relationship between lovers, right? Does that husband wife relationship tie in any way supplant or otherwise alter the ties between mother and daughter? All right, that's all we have for you this time. Angela Carter, next time.